Hey everybody, it's Anna and welcome back to my booktube channel. This video is going to be my geekly wrap-up for the week of November 18th through November 24th. This week I read three books and I played two new board games. I also am going to be wrapping up the first book in my wrap-up, which is Disabled People Destroy Fantasy, which is one of the um, series in the Destroy series, I guess, of um, Uncanny Magazine. I actually read this last week, but I forgot to wrap it up in that video because I read it on my Kindle, and as we know, if I can't see the thing physically there in front of me, I kind of forget that it exists. So I read Disabled People Destroy Fantasy. I really enjoyed it. I think overall I enjoyed the fiction much less than I enjoyed the science fiction issue of the magazine, but I really liked the poetry, I really liked the nonfiction, and obviously like I think it's really important that the Destroy series exists and continue to exist. I would highly recommend it. It's very affordable. You can find it for like $3.99 on the Kindle store if you're interested in reading and supporting stories that are by and about disabled people. So would highly recommend that. So I read three books this week. Um, one of them was for the Believeathon, and that was the most recent Vanderbeekers book, which is called The Vanderbeekers to the Rescue. This is in that same series that I have been wrapping up for most of Believe. In this book, the Vanderbeekers' mom is about to um, get her bakery business launched off the ground and started up, and the kids kind of inadvertently create a bit of a fiasco when the health inspector comes, which results in their mom getting her home baking license revoked. So they have a week to just come up with a creative solution to how they're going to help their mom's business get back up off the ground. I thought that this book was charming, as always. I don't think that the story was necessarily like as engaging as the previous two books books, but I still really appreciated it. I'm glad that I read it, and I gave it four out of five stars. Then I read a book that has been on my TBR for ages. It's called We Were Feminist Once, From Riot Girl to Cover Girl, The Buying and Selling of a Political Movement by Andy Zeisler. Now, this book came out in 2016. I really wanted to read it in 2016, and I remember I didn't pick it up then because it was a brand new hardcover then, it was expensive, I was not able to afford it at the time. I finally found this copy at a used bookstore later. Reading it three years later I think does somewhat dampen some of the message of this book. The book's message overall is pretty important. It's about what happens when you take feminism, which was a sort of thing that we all understood was a political movement with various levels of people thinking that it was appropriate or not in the second wave and into the third wave, and how the marketplace and capitalism has kind of co-opted the language and rhetoric of feminism and gender equality as a way to make money. Whereas feminism is no longer a choice that you're necessarily making or a political action that you're taking, feminism is buying a t-shirt that says this is what a feminist looks like. And Andy Zeisler talks about how she's not trying to, you know, dog on people that are making feminist merch, but she is calling for looking critically at the way, especially um, large corporations uh, try to appropriate the language of feminism. So I thought that this book was good, although as a book I don't know how strong it was. For one thing, I definitely think it was an instance of kind of preaching to the converted. Like I don't know how many people who don't already know about this would pick up this book and read it. And if that was what she was going for, that's fine. I just don't know that that was necessarily like the strongest way to argue it. It also did kind of read a little bit more like episodic articles strung together, which makes sense because Andy has been the editor-in-chief of Bitch Magazine, or she had been the editor-in-chief at Bitch for years and years up to the publication of this book, so her background is from journalism. So if you like your nonfiction that reads a little bit more like journalistic articles, then maybe this is a good book for you. I tend to not like that style of nonfiction writing very much, but again, that is just personal taste that is not, you know, to say that this book is bad. One thing though that I think the book kind of does suffer from is the fact that so much has changed in the last three years. This book was published before the 2016 like election results and we just like have kind of moved on in some ways in our discussion of the issues facing feminism now. Like this book does do a good job of trying to highlight uh, queer perspectives and trans perspectives, especially um, kind of like early in a book that was not by a black author, like drawing attention to the um, murder and assaults and the vulnerability of black trans women specifically in the current climate 
Um, but a lot has changed in the discourse. We have bathroom bills, we have hashtag me too, that movement, we have the climate change crisis becoming all the more acute. So definitely reading this, I was like, oh wait, why, why isn't she writing about XYZ? And then I was like, oh yeah, because this book came out in 2016. And while those things were still like issues that we were dealing with in 2016, they have migrated much more so to the forefront of the conversation. So I think that this is like important as far as uh, picking out some issues and some discourse in a particular time in the feminist movement, but I don't know how well the like actual meat of it really holds up in 2019 going into 2020. So I think that the book sadly kind of like outdated itself a little bit through no fault of its own. It's just that a lot of this conversation has begun moving so quickly, especially surrounding the things that Andy brings up in the book. So there's that. I gave it three out of five. Still good. Would recommend it if you're interested in the topic. Then I managed to finish the last book on my TBR for the Indigathon, which is There There by Tommy Orange. I was very much not prepared for just how much of a punch this story would pack. Um, well, wow, where do I even start with this? First of all, I guess thank you to Brody if you're watching this for recommending this and talking about this book all the time. I don't think I would have picked it up if it hadn't been for you, and I'm so glad I did, so thank you very much for recommending it. Um, as I mentioned before in my TBR video, if you didn't watch that, this is a book that follows 12 perspectives of different people, most of them Native Americans, that are getting ready to attend the big Oakland powwow. The book starts out with a sort of very historically rich, almost like you're sitting down to listen to people talk about their family stories and their everyday lives. It's got this very storytelling lilt to it. And then about halfway through the book, some events occur. I'm being purposefully vague because I don't want to spoil it. And the tension in the chapters just ramps way up. I think that this book is absolutely masterful in the way in which it creates a character-driven story and then puts these characters all together in a very plot-driven situation. I don't think I've ever read a book that did something like this this well while managing to have both of those aspects of the writing be so strong and still let 12 characters, I mean, how on earth do you give 12 characters an amazing each unique voice. Like, I've read so many books where characters' names, you know, blend into each other, and I don't really remember from one chapter to the next who's even speaking, but Tommy Orange just made each of them so individual and distinct that I know that these characters are going to stay with me, even though I finished the book long after the chapters closed. I really loved this book. I gave it five out of five stars. The end of it was kind of hard to read, um, just because there was some stuff that happened in the book that, like, has to do with a really, like, specific fear that I have, um, but I don't think that, like, that is going to hamper anyone else's enjoyment of the book. That was really just more of a me thing, and I would highly recommend everyone in my life to read this. Now, let's go on to the board games that I play, but before I do that... <laughs> I have to give a big shout out and thank you to Erin from The Geeky Gimp. Um, Y'all probably know her as my co-host for the Disability Readathon. She is also a dear friend of mine. And Erin had asked me if I wanted some books that she was getting rid of. Uh, she thought that I would be interested in them and she also was going to send me um, some little buttons and a tote bag that she had designed and made for the Disability Readathon. So I said yes. And what she did not tell me was that she was going to send me a giant box full of, I think it was like seven new board games from her collection that she thought that I would enjoy playing that she just wanted to pass on. And I was floored when I opened my mailbox and I saw this giant box and I opened it and I was like, what on earth could she have put in this box? This one book and like a tote bag don't take up this much space. Why is the box so big? That's why. So thank you so much for sending me that, Erin. I really appreciate it. I'm very excited to get to playing all of those games, especially with Thanksgiving coming up this week. We're going to be having people over, so I'm really hoping to get some of those to the table. 
Um, I will, of course, be wrapping them up in future Geekly wrap-ups, so if you want to see all the games that Erin so kindly surprised me with, just, you know, keep your eyes peeled for that wrap-up. Um, but I did play two new games. One of them is called Tainted Grail, and I'm not holding it up because the box is, like, really heavy, and also the game is still kind of in the process of being played on my table, and I didn't really feel like packing it all up, but it is basically a kind of an adventure game that takes place in a very gothic, twisted, um, Arthurian mythos. It's a sort of campaign game that's played over 15 chapters, and the chapters are really long. I think, like, if you play the entire game start to finish it, on average, takes you, like, 100 hours. But it's very easily, like, broken up into episodes, and you can save the game at any time almost as if it's a video game. So I'm playing through that with my husband right now. He's playing a character called Bior, who is a magical smith, and I'm playing a character called Maggot, because I had to play the character called Maggot, of course, who is a druid that has somehow become addicted to these like magical psychedelic mushrooms and elixirs that exist in the world, and they give him these very like vivid nightmares, but also kind of like an insight into the fabric of reality. He's super fun to play as. It's coming back to bite me in the butt because in this game, like nightmares can actually have negative impacts on your health. Um, and your sanity and other things and I'm just like if that ain't the truth like wow way to call me out fictional board game person but I am really enjoying this most of the gameplay is us moving around on a little modular map and we you know have decks that we're building for things like combat and diplomacy a lot of the strategy that comes with moving around the map is trying to keep these beacons lit that will uh allow you to actually be able to travel safely from place to place. I don't really want to say too much more about it because I don't want to spoil specific plot points and also because we have only finished chapter one. We've been playing it for, you know, maybe an hour or two almost every night this week and we've just now finished the first chapter. So that's Tainted Grail. The other game that we played is actually one that I got as a gift for my husband because our wedding anniversary was on Sunday. Love so sweet. It was amazing. Um, and I got him a game that's called Vinhos, and this is a game by his favorite board game designer, whose name is Vital Lacerda, and it is a game about running vineyards and wineries. It is a sort of like classic Euro game, but taken to the max where you are spending your actions in order to be able to do things like open vineyards, hire farmers and wine experts. Um, you have to like age your wines in order to like be able to sell them. And then every so often there are these fairs where like wine experts come and judge your wines based off of how well you're playing the game. I feel like it's really hard to explain how this is translated into a board game, but basically just take someone who has like a ton of attention to detail and a really keen aesthetic sensibility and have them design a board game about wine <laughs> and wine making. So I had got him this game for our anniversary because I knew that he really wanted it. We set it up, we got through maybe a turn or two last night before we realized how late it was and that we needed to go to bed because we had to function like adults the next day. But that's Vinhos and I really enjoyed playing that. So again, a little bit of a lighter reading week. I'm anticipating that this week, uh, as I'm filming, is the week of Thanksgiving. It's probably going to be a bit of a lighter week as well, just because of the holidays, and I'll be busy with that. So I hope that y'all are taking great care of yourselves. I hope that you have a happy, happy Thanksgiving holiday for those of you celebrating, and for those of you traveling, stay safe and have fun. And I will see you in the next one. Bye!